Perfect. Thank you. Good morning or afternoon. Uh, welcome to our Administration and Finance Committee meeting on September 6, 2022. I am present in Council Chambers with Councillors Clark, Galway, Kiefer, Nowak, Shantz, and uh, not regional chair. Okay. Other members of regional council are participating electronically. So I'll uh, call the meeting to order and ask uh, Caitlin Gillis to do the roll call, please. Thank you, Chair Jowett. Councillor Verbanovic? Councillor Clark? Present. Councillor Lorenz? Here. Chair Jowett? Here. Councillor Erb? Present. Councillor Nowak? Present. Councillor Kiefer? Present. Councillor McGarry? Councillor Armstrong? Present. Councillor Harris? Councillor Schantz? Present. Councillor Strickland? Councillor Foxton? Present. And Councillor Galloway? Present. And we have regrets from Regional Chair Redmond and Councillor Jaworski. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry? And Councillor McGarry is present. Sorry, I missed my, my name. I did see your smiling face return, though. <laughs> okay. I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather virtually today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral people. We acknowledge the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today, their achievements, their, and their contributions to our community. Now, I'm going to be looking for any declarations of pecuniary interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Scanning the Zoom. Ah, <laughs> Caitlin. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jaworski is absent, um, but has submitted a written declaration of direct pecuniary interest with respect to report PDL CAS 2208 on the consent agenda due to his being on the staff recommended membership of the Municipal Election Compliance Audit Committee for the 2022 to 2026 term. Thank you. Uh, seeing no presentations, seeing no delegations, I'll go to the consent agenda and request for any items to be removed. This is the time for that to happen. Uh, so, uh, if you wish to remove any any items, this is at the time. If not, uh, we'll con we'll continue to the consent agenda. <coughs> I'm looking for a motion to, uh, to uh, approve and receive for information. Oh, Councillor Kiefer, Councillor Rents, all those in favor, please use your buttons. <coughs> Terry, thank you. And we'll move to the um, matters at hand. And the first one would be 8.1. Huh? Sorry, we've changed the numbers. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Yes, yeah, sorry. Right, I'm, I'm, I've got you now. Okay, 9.1. And this is the uh, further uh, to the discussion and closed. And I'm looking for Mr. Uh, Vanelli to introduce the report. And Matthew Chandy and Cheryl Branner are also presenting and will be available for questions. <coughs> Sorry. About that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my name is Mike Finelli. I'm the Director of Total Awards within Human Resources and Citizenship Service, and I'm joined by Cheryl Braun, who's the Director of Corporate Finance, and Matthew Chandy, who's the Director of Economic Development and Innovation. And this report represents a collaboration between uh, our three areas. So Canada is in a unique economic period. This is, of course, having an impact on all Ontarians, including those living and working in the region. The intent of this informational report is to discuss the current state of the economy, how it's impacting the region, with a particular focus on what we're hearing from employers uh, that are operating within the region. The report also includes a discussion on the region as an employer and the actions that we are taking to ensure that we attract and retain the talent necessary to operate regional programs and, and best serve the region. So I'll take a moment to project the report and turn it over to Cheryl Braun to provide some background and, uh, and regional economic context. Excuse me for a moment here. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Mike. And through you, Chair, um, I thought I'd just provide a little bit of back, uh, a backdrop to the conversation today, both from a national perspective and a regional perspective. So as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and ensuing recovery has had effects on our national economy and labour market. We know that the economy is overheating. Overall, wages are up um, year over year above 5% due to inflation and the labor market. Um, additionally, uh, unemployment is rather low, uh, the lowest it's been since reporting began in 1976, and it's dipped below 5%. Um, and then additionally, uh, the GDP growth has been quite high. It's beginning to slow, but it's still up above 3% at 3.1%. A lot of talk these days about inflation. Uh, we are, we know it's at a 40-year high. Um, currently, inflation is sitting at around 7.6% year over year for July. We know that's come down a little bit from August, uh, but it is quite high, and there is some concern about a wage price spiral. Um, the central bank, the Bank of Canada, has been trying to reduce these inflationary um, pressures by increasing their overnight rates. Uh, so far this year, they've increased it by 2.25%. Um, there is some speculation, probably not unfounded, that tomorrow we'll see another further rate increase in the range of three quarters of a percent. Um, and then lastly, on the national side, we know that public debt um, is high and is more expensive. So uh, during the pandemic, uh, public debt has topped three point, sorry, three trillion dollars. And that um, equates to around $75,000 per person. Um, so this is also leading to a, a GDP, sorry, debt to GDP ratio of almost 130%. And this is the highest we've had in Canadian history. Next slide, please. And so from a regional economic context, um, just like any other municipality, uh, the, region is, the region's budget is significantly impacted by um, very high inflation and additionally capital cost escalation. Uh, so back in the fall of 21, when we were putting our 2022 budget together, we had been projecting inflation in, in the range of 2 to 3%, uh, an average of about 2.6% by major Canadian banks. We know that as of July of this year, it's up above 7.6%. And um, the year-to-date average is even around 6.8%. So we have a little bit of ground to make up in the 23 budget for 2022. Um, so that said, our projections for 2023 suggest a tax rate increase, um, I would say, in, in excess of 10%, uh, just to handle inflationary per, uh, impacts, as well as continue with our, our business plans and master plan implementations. So some of these drivers include um, the fuel costs. We know that that fuel costs have been up around $2 a litre. They've come down a little bit, but they're still significantly higher than we had budgeted, uh, about 55% higher than we had budgeted. Service contracts, a number of our service contracts have provisions within them that escalate the contract value based on CPI. So as CPI increases, we need to increase our uh, provisions for our service uh, sorry, service contracts. <clears throat> Capital costs. Um, it, it should be no surprise that um, we've seen this through tender awards. Um, Capital costs are escalating quite significantly. The year over year uh, non-residential building construction cost index for Toronto, which is what we use to index our DC bylaw, um, has increased about 17% year over year. So that's quite significant. Uh, so that's going to have to be reflected in our 2023 capital program. And then lastly, um, labor contracts. We are seeing some settlement trends in Ontario that are increasing above what we may have had in our budgets. So uh, we do need to develop the right strategy to attracting and retaining staff. Um, in, to ensure that regional services will continue to be delivered in the most cost-effective manner. So with that, I think I'm turning it over to my colleague in ECDEV, or sorry, Economic Development, uh, Matthew Chandy, to talk us talk to, to talk about the talent plan for the region. Great, thank, thank you, Cheryl. 
Um, so yes, uh, regional uh, regional council uh, recently supported the development of a new talent uh, attraction and retention plan for Waterloo Region uh, to support our uh, industry sectors here that have uh, been struggling with talent challenges uh, that's been accelerated uh, since the pandemic. And to support that work, staff engaged and, and just had conversations with almost 100 local businesses across Waterloo Region and, and stakeholders and partners and the, the the number one thing that we heard uh, during those conversations uh, the number one challenge faced by businesses right now is uh, being able to attract new talent being able to retain the existing talent and the impacts that that has on their uh, operations and their ability to grow and so uh, really a lot of businesses are asking for help uh, asking for help and and looking for new ways to uh, come up with strategies on dealing with the talent challenge uh, working more collaboratively with other businesses in their sectors working more collaboratively with local and senior levels of government and coming up with ways to uh, make sure that uh, they can continue to grow and and uh, thrive um, and so if i can get you to go to the next slide mike out of those conversations, we heard uh, a range of uh, needs that businesses would like to see in a, in a talent plan. And again, everything from uh, really speaking to the quality of life here to talking about the growth population, uh, the growth in population uh, that's expected in, in Waterloo Region to working uh, differently with post-secondary institutions that we have here in Waterloo Region to really support the development of a new pipeline of uh, talent. Also thinking about things like immigration and how we leverage the number of newcomers coming to Waterloo Region and Canada and how that uh, can be uh, leveraged to support uh, future workforce needs. And also, as I mentioned before, working differently uh, and more collaboratively with uh, local government and senior levels of government. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, we, you know, after those conversations, uh, really one of the things that stood out was the overall structural shifts that uh, employers across Waterloo Region are seeing. Uh, it's not only Waterloo Region across the country are seeing uh, in the workforce demands. And so one of the things that really stood out from the pandemic was the hybrid flexible nature of work. And so many uh, employees are asking for this right now, but uh, it's also forcing businesses to revisit the different job functions that they have and, and also look at uh, the opportunity to offer that flexibility, whether it's working remotely or uh, working in some sort of hybrid way. And that virtual workforce uh, actually has uh, created um, uh, a demand for employees uh, that are, may already be working for some of the employers here to go and work ex externally outside of Waterloo Region and vice versa. Uh, you know, businesses are now looking more outside of Waterloo Region to meet their talent needs if the virtual option exists. I think we've all seen the uh, pressures on the overall employment rates here, having very low employment rates locally, uh, provincially and nationally. That's really creating uh, increased pressures on the available workforce pool. And so, you know, next slide, please. If we think too about what employees are asking for and the workforce is asking for, a lot of uh, employees coming out of the pandemic are in fact sort of revisiting, you know, their, um, their current position and what they want to do. So uh, they're, you know, asking, you know, for uh, more in the, in the terms of flexibility, uh, better work-life balance, uh, and really revisiting their opportunities. And so employers, what we heard was, uh, you know, employees are really looking differently at how they invest in their employees. And that includes things like reskilling uh, and upskilling. So really investing more into, into their employees and trying to figure out new ways to attract and retain uh, talent here. So uh, working collaboratively with uh, those local businesses and local community partners, their municipalities and others, we hope to come up with some new strategies to support our local businesses here uh, and, and ensure that Waterloo Region uh, stays, uh, stays ahead of the game when it comes to attracting and retaining talent. Uh, next, I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Mike. 
thanks thanks very much much for that uh, Cheryl and and Matthew um, so what we've, we've what we've done now is we've looked at uh, workforce analytics uh, as they apply to the region as an employer uh, to attempt to assess how these macro trends are, are impacting us uh, as an organization and what I want to start by saying is that by by the standard metrics we're, we're stable and this includes looking at things like the number of permanent FTEs uh, over the last number of years, uh, the portion of the organization, which is management uh, versus versus individual contributor, things like overtime utilization. Um, by, by the macro indicators, we, we are stable, but it's evident that the environment around us is changing due to the volatility of the Canadian economy and, and the tremendously tight labor market. And we've summarized this in six trends, um, which we believe are facing the region. So the first is this this perfect storm on, on public sector compensation. So we know that wages are being reported as increasing by 5.2% uh, year over year across the Canadian economy, which is far in excess of historical increases across both management uh, and unionized groups uh, in the region and, and other public sector employers. And we're seeing other municipalities introduce new elements of compensation across the organizations. We believe that the municipal sector is in a uniquely challenging position to complete to compete on compensation alone, you know, as Cheryl described earlier, our programs correlate highly with in inflation. Our material costs, such as fuel and building materials, as well as labor costs, uh, have been escalating. Uh, the second trend is, is leadership uh, retirements. So for the purposes of discussing this trend, I'll be focused in on the age of 55. This is an age commonly used as a proxy for when individuals begin considering uh, retirement options. And if you look at the commissioners and the group below them, more than half of that group will be over 55 by uh, 2027. If you compare that to the federal government, who make their data publicly available, uh, only a quarter of their senior leaders are, are presently over 55. So there's an opportunity over the next five years for the organization to be quite deliberate about uh, its succession planning. Uh, last on the slide is a point around compensation. So we maintain, the region as an employer maintains its competitiveness with other municipalities by regularly benchmarking its, its compensation to uh, organizations who we attract talent from and, and lose talent to. So we pay close attention to our comparative municipalities and we aim to neither lead nor lag the market. What we're seeing some organizations do um, emerging from the pandemic is take more aggressive, aggressive strategies uh, regarding benchmarking where, you know, rather than targeting the middle of the market, they're targeting uh, higher percentiles and, and aiming to lead uh, their uh, lead comparative jurisdictions on, on compensation. Uh, this slide talks about the changing talent landscape. So, although unemployment, uh, so unemployment does remain under five percent, which you know, Cheryl indicated earlier is the the lowest level it's been at um, in since Statistics Canada began recording data in 1976. Um, what StatsCan is reporting is that job seekers are targeting um, more back office roles, which makes recruitment even more challenging for roles requiring specialized skills. Uh, the reality we're operating in is that this is a employees or, or job seekers market. In light of these trends, we, we need to focus on our competitive advantage to attract and retain talent. Specifically, we have an opportunity to shape a narrative that builds engagement, expands our niche as an employer and as a community. HR's priorities are, are heavily focused on building engagement um, to realize not only the attraction and, and retention benefits, but also the productivity benefits that come with their engaged workforce. In terms of the acute talent shortages, um, we sorry, pardon me. In terms of the acute talent shortages, we are facing uh, acute attraction and retention areas in parts of the organization where specialized skills and training are needed. And the region must ensure that it takes targeted action to ensure that it's able to attract and retain talent in those groups. The last point here is one on regional growth. So it's been published and it's known that the region's expecting to grow by 300,000 residents and 178,000 uh, new jobs over the next 30 years. Um, when we grow and change, we need a regional workforce that's able to structure itself to support transformation. Even acutely, when we make a decision to make a change in programming, it pulls on resources from other parts of the organizations to set things up efficiently and correctly. And 
you know, the importance of this point is really to say that we need an engaged workforce in order to deliver and evolve service in, in a world that's, that's changing around us. Roles and responsibilities are evolving and, and changing. So this slide talks about um, HRC's top priorities, and the progress it's made on them in 2022. We regularly report on uh, our progress in achieving those goals, including through vehicles such as the mid-year update. Um, still, I, I wanted to draw a few of these out uh, as part of the presentation. And these are areas that human resources and citizen service uh, within the region has been focusing on. So first, we have a hybrid work policy uh, that's yielding the, the intended outcomes on flexibility while maintaining the cultural elements of, of in-person work. Uh, beyond the initial implementation, we've led a series of workshops to support leaders through the change of managing hybrid work workers where that's occurring. And we've seen this policy allow us to cast a wider net uh, in our recruitments, uh, a broader geographic region. We launched a well-being strategy in June, which included a focus on mental health and resilience with targeted supports for uh, our frontline employees. And uh, aside from training sessions, we were able to offer a temporary change to, to mental, mental health benefits uh, at a low cost to give more options uh, for employees to access care uh, who are seeking it. We've also begun uh, advancing our diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, belonging work further. So we plan to launch a demographic survey in the next month or so, which is an important initial step that organizations take as they review and structure their diversity, equity, and inclusion programming. We've also delivered a significant amount of uh, training over the summer, including in um, uh, the parts of the organization listed on the slide. Our strategy to attract talent up on the top right there uh, has evolved in, in recent months. Our LinkedIn page is a great example of this uh, to show the efforts underway to increase our online presence using social media, market our brand, and, and focus on the candidate experience. We're also ensuring clear information is available to prospective candidates on uh, the non-cash elements of compensation, which are available. We offer competitive benefits with other municipalities, and that's important to express to candidates who are considering multiple offers. In terms of our employee value proposition, we're focusing on our rewards framework beyond cash compensation. Uh, one size does not fit all across the organization in terms of um, the value that employees uh, get from work. We need to be precise and thoughtful um, to manage costs related to comp in the course of conducting this work. We're looking at immediate, short, and long-term actions on comp to address emerging issues. That said, um, you know, throughout this, this work and this analysis, um, it's important to manage costs responsibly um, and effectively. Last, uh, to our talent management program, program consisting of 360 assessments, succession planning, and talent mapping. It's been developed and is presently being consulted on within the organization. And this will be a big step in having the infrastructure to further their talent um, internally within the organization. Just to close the presentation and, and bring together the content that you've heard from um, uh, Cheryl and myself and Matthew on, uh, we wanted to just uh, close by you know, indicating that the 2023 budget planning principles uh, embed a focus on people. You know, as we uh, we're looking at service levels to reflect the changing needs uh, of, of the community and adjusting them where necessary, but we're also uh, open to investing in the critical elements of, of organizational success. Things like employee well-being, fostering innovation, um, organizational development, and building our capacity to attract and retain are key priorities that we're being considered of. Uh, as we go through the 2023 planning process. And we're doing that in a manner that um, ensures collective accountability across the region's leadership team. So uh, I want to say thank you to uh, my colleagues for, for their presentation uh, and also for uh, the time on the agenda today. And, and with that, I'll pull the share down and, and open. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Cheryl. Questions. Okay. Um, so, uh, thank you for the presentation. Very much appreciated. Very comprehensive. And uh, we'll kind of keep moving down the agenda. So, again, thank you. Uh, and now we're on to the Child Wit Witness Center funding request. And I'm looking to Craig uh, Dyer to introduce and present the report. Are you ready, Craig? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me.
Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just, uh, just very briefly, um, a delegation uh, from the Child Witness Centre came to Council, I believe, uh, back in August, making a request uh, for fifty thousand dollars. Staff uh, reached out to the organization, and they provided. Uh, some written documentation in support of that request. We've attached it to, to the staff report, which uh, does recommend uh, no action on that particular request, and staff are available to answer any questions. Much appreciated. Let me just, oh, okay. Councillor Clark, it looks like you are up. Thanks. Uh, I don't have any questions of staff. I will I will move this, and I just want to remind council that, that um, this has been a hard decision we've been having to make pretty much every meeting over the last little while. We did turn down another similar request just last meeting and another one uh, earlier on in the in the summer. And I think that um, you know the, the position we find ourselves in, as we've discussed, is we are experiencing ourselves a huge shortfall uh, between what we spend and what we receive from the province on our mandated programs, and, and we're just not in a position to to continue to, um, uh, as my colleague has said, backstop the province on its on its underfunding when we can't even do that for the programs that we are in fact mandated to offer. Thank you uh, for that very clear articulation. Uh, much appreciated. As I know, my colleagues have been hanging on every word because it's absolutely uh, the challenge we face. Uh, so I, I see no further hands. So I'm going to. Uh, I'm just going to call the question then. Uh, so uh, can I get a mover, please? Uh, Councillor Kiefer, Councillor Clark, all those in favour, please use your buttons. That's carried. Thank you very much. No information or correspondence. Uh, is there any other business? Okay. Our next meeting will be October 4th of 2022. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn, please. Thank you, Councillor McGarry, seconded by Councillor Schantz. I think that's what you were doing, was it, Councillor Schantz? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All those in favor, please use your buttons. Carried, thank you.